Translational medicine is bringing ideas and discoveries from basic science to clinical benefit. It is a bridge between laboratory research and clinical research. It translates in humans what we have discovered either in vitro or in animals. Without translational, translational research, we wouldn't have any uh, new products and to their treatment. It's important for the public because quite a bit of translational research is to do with public health, not, not just individual health. Uh, it's important to clinical scientists who wish to pursue research into the underlying mechanisms of disease. Uh, it, it's also important for um, the life sciences industries, particularly the pharmaceutical industry, and it's, 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 it's important for the European economy. We want to have a life sciences industry that's flourishing in Europe. It takes far too long from a scientific discovery or identification of a new target to actually develop a drug that can be used in patients. There are delays at every stage in the drug discovery process. I think when I looked into this for the purposes of the summit, I could only identify about five new classes of drug that have been introduced in the last 50 years. This is way below the numbers of new drugs seen in other areas like cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, neuroscience. Well, I think right now what we see is it takes more than 14 years to basically take early target discovery all the way to approval. And approval isn't the end of that drug development because you have what's called phase four development, which could be years that pharma continues to have to support data management and understanding of the safety tolerability of the compound in a larger patient population. Well, toxicology studies are based on a, a paradigm that was developed 40, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, as to what seemed like a good idea at the time. And one of the difficulties is there's never been a scientific, a proper scientific rationale for the components of regulatory toxicology. Does it have to be as stringent? We just don't know. Uh, and nobody's managed to bring together the totality of all the toxicology studies, which run to thousands now, uh, and look to see which findings were predictable in, in terms of human beings and which ones weren't. Regulatory authorities are becoming increasingly risk averse so that they're demanding more and more safety data before a drug goes on the market. And the problem with that is uh, that it just puts up the cost of drug development. We are now curing a lot of patients with cancer. Not necessarily lung cancer, but many other diseases. And so those patients need to be surveyed for 20 years for side effects, for secondary tumour, for fertility, for example, but also for major societal issues. Do they keep a job? Do they get a job? Do they have a mortgage? If the current legislation is voted on data protection and that you cannot keep the data, have large database using this data or follow a patient for 20 years, how can you assess long-term results? I think that the pharmaceutical community and academia are poised to actually have some of the best collaborations that we could have historically ever had. We have the, some of the best science and the best technology at this point in time to be able to have very strong and interactive collaborations. However, I think the pendulum has shifted way too far to the extreme with concerns about conflict of interest, uh, in relationships between academia and pharma that has resulted in less collaboration as compared to fostering more collaboration. The Clinical Trials Directive, um, by the Commission's own admission, has had some un unforeseen consequences. The numbers of clinical trials uh, between 2007 and 2011 have reduced by 25%. The cost of indemnity has increased by 800% of insurance, and the duration of getting authorization is now months. We are currently conducting a very large lung cancer trial in non-small cell cancer patients. It's a very important trial, but we want to conduct it in 10 different countries, 62 sites, with all the regulatory hassle concerning uh, insurance certificate, the length of patient information sheet, the uh, submission of the dossier to competent authorities, the heterogeneity 
of requirement in Spain, in Poland, in UK, in Italy, and so uh, really launching a large trial, which is supposed to be a changing practice trial for non-small cell lung cancer, which is a very common disease and very life-threatening disease, it is a nightmare. I think the other barriers are related to the protocol development and the magnitude of interactions we have to go through various uh, country health authorities to be able to get the protocol approved. And, uh, and so I think if we had a harmonized process with our health authorities, that would be another opportunity to see more rapid drug development in terms of approval of protocols as compared to having to go through multiple amendments of protocols just simply based on an individual comp uh, country. The European Commission has proposed a clinical trials regulation to replace the clinical trials directive and that's been agreed by the European Parliament so it'll come into force in about 2016 as I understand it. The new regulation means that it's a regulation and no adaptation or interpretation by each member state. That is a major difference between a directive which need to be implemented in national laws why the regulation, that's it, you take it as it is. It's trying to produce some proportionality into it and it's trying to introduce it, uh, arrangements that will make it much easier to do uh, clinical trials across uh, member states. We know and we are confident that there are a lot of simplification, for example, a single portal of entry, concentrate, uh, harmonized pharmacovigilance, coordinated assessment between competent authority and ethics committee. So it goes in the very good direction. There are still points where we are more uh, reluctant to, to see and to say that it's a major victory, but at least it's a major uh, step forward. I think the European Respiratory Society can play a role in the future in facilitating drug development because we have access to patients, we interact with scientists, the pharmaceutical industry and people who undertake clinical trials. So I think by understanding the delays in the process we can help to break down the barriers and therefore accelerate drug development. Societies like the ERS and other societies like the ERS along with patient advocacy groups uh, can come together in more of a collaborative relationship with pharma and I would also have that collaboration joined by patient advocacy groups as well as health authorities to be able to align ourselves in terms of opportunities specifically related to perhaps new and novel efficacy endpoints. What we have to keep in Europe, because we have been pioneer, we have the capacity of excellence, we have the university, we have the patient, we have the expertise. So what we need is really a legal framework and a new model of partnership to make sure to take use and benefit of those tremendous knowledge and to be able to translate that to significant progress for the patient, for the society, but also for competitiveness of Europe. I think what is important first of all is to identify what the barriers are and then to consider ways to overcome these barriers and I'm quite confident that we are going to make progress and accelerate the process of drug discovery but this is a big task but particularly relevant to the development of respiratory drugs. Mm -hmm.